Welcome to Sparks of Love. My name is Jerry Lynn Sparks, and I'm on a journey to discover what love is. Um, and today we have with us um, the media scholar at St. John Fisher College, Professor Tom Proietti. Did I say you it said right? said that beautifully. Yay, yeah. with my Southern accent Beautiful, and yes, everything. I love hearing it. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. A pleasure to be here. Yeah, and we also have Evan King, our producer, who is... Hi, Evan. Um, Sucking on ducking. Very, 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 very professional. Yes. For this <laughs> and then we have uh, Scott Fitzgerald, who is the studio owner and um, our um, you know director, etc. He's day. the resident rock star. He is the resident <laughs> rock star. Rock He's Vox Studios, R O C V O X Studios, and Bushnell's Basin mm-hmm. in lovely um, Western New York. Rockbox, um, Rockbox Studio. So um, I invited Tom here today um, because he has someone that is super connected to our society. Like everywhere I go, people know who Tom Proietti is. And I had heard your name for many years. Do you know Tom Proietti? I'm like, no. I'm, I've am i lived here 21 years and your name just kept coming up. And I think we have mutual friends and that's kind of how I got to know you. Interestingly, tons I, of mutual friends. I, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I got to know you on social media before I met you in person. Right. And I think we had known each other maybe at least a year. And right. I ended up running into you at CMAC, C-Mac. at the um, I Love Concerts. And apparently you and your Same wife do, here. too. Yeah, yeah. And I think I had my son with me, my you son, did? Jared, yeah. who has autism and right. loves music. And there he was. I'm like, Tom. <laughs> and you're like, who is this crazy Southerner coming at me, like waving? <laughs> crazy Southerner might be redundant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not kidding. But no, I could just it's tell. A double entendre. <laughs> yeah, a double he, entendre. He, he's just one of, you know, you're just one of those people that very welcoming. And I knew that I could just run up to you and you wouldn't freak out. <laughs> well, just for some you know, perspective, I, I've had 17,000 college students. Wow. That's distinct college students. Wow. Some of them I had multiple times yeah. over. That's and amazing. most of them were in media. So. Yeah. You know, they've ended up working in the industry and they tend to be, you know, a pretty common place people yeah. in our community. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is I, I think I'm welcoming and they, they've stayed in my life. Yes. So, you know, on Facebook, you can only mm-hmm. have 5,000 friends. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. There's a limit. And oh. if, you, if you go past 5,000 friends... It's That's a, a minimum, judgmental, minimum it? charge of $280 a month because then you have to call it a fan page. Oh, wow. So I like I have a backlog of probably 2,500 people with friend yeah. requests, but I'm not going to pay 280 bucks a month. You send yeah. them my way. Yeah. yeah. I'll send I them need, to Scott. Some more friends. Right. Well, could you do it like a secondary page? <laughs> Are they page? friends though? No, a secondary page would be just twice as much work, you know, yeah, and, and people true. say, well, how, how do you put so much material on? And I find that the, you know, every morning I used to spend at least an hour and a half reading a newspaper. Yeah. And so I still do a lot of newspaper reading, but I also do a lot of scrolling. Yeah. And I think there's so much knowledge in crystals as there mm-hmm. as there is in, you know, as deep form. So yeah. I do a lot of both and I like to take those things. And if something makes me laugh, too, I like to uh, s- send it along. And Yeah, I love yeah. it. Well, that's one of the things that Evan and Scott don't know that I did. I asked Tom last week, knowing that he was going to come on the show, if he could use his platform, which gets a lot of followers yes. and posts, if he could ask his followers and friends right. um, was what love too. is. And yeah. so I actually purposely didn't read it. I didn't go in to oh, see. You didn't no, read it. I wanted to hear it from your lens. I oh. wanted to stay fresh and be authentic in my responses. So can you tell me a little bit about how you posted it, how you worded it, and what kind of responses you got? I just worded it exactly what you just said. Yeah, yeah. We were texting each other, and I, yeah. I put up. And I, I think I did it during the day, and I rephrased the question several times. Okay. There probably were 600 Posts. Really? Okay. And, and love is all over the place. I mean, yeah. love is, is, it's omnipresent. It's also difficult. It's challenging. It's beautiful. It's mm-hmm. kind. It's unkind. Uh, is, it, is it? Is love unkind? Oh, sure. I how, mean, the, how is love unkind? Oh, think, you know, think about the people who, all those people who get married, 51% of them are going to end up getting divorced. Most of those divorces are not kind of like, oh, I still love you, but let's go in di- different directions because mm. You know, love can be really finite. I'm very fortunate. I've been with the same person since I was 16. She was 15. Mm. And I just, I look at her every day and, you know, this sounds schmaltzy, but it's not. Yeah. I, mean, no, I, can tell it's I win. Deal. I win every day. I just look at her. I, I, you know, I sometimes, a couple of years, I actually used to go into college classes with the yellow flag that the referees, ha- you know, the <laughs> football referees have. But I would also do this when a kid, you know, when a student made a really good point. I, <laughs> Do the do the touchdown or the the field goal is yeah, good. Yeah. So with my wife, I do that a lot too. And, so, and you know, we don't we don't really argue. And I love I love her madly, what? but there's you don't argue. No, we don't argue. I just don't let it happen. You know, I, well, you know, she's not wow. she's not an arguer either. So 
Yeah, we we can negotiate. Yeah, but we, you know we don't argue, and that's, that's and we laugh beautiful. a lot. I mean, I yeah. think one of the real keys, and that's one of the things I I found out from the you know people on Facebook is, uh, first off, that love can be terminal. Yeah. You know, it can it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. I mean, it, it percolates no different than any other emotion. You know, and you, and I asked the question about what's the difference between infatuation and love, yeah. and there's oh, you know, there's huge difference, but. At the moment you're infatuated, you don't know there's a difference. Yeah. Your friends might know and your family might know. And, you know, lo- love is like no different than any other emotion. And, you know, and it's no different than a business cycle either. By the way, mm. you launch a business, the business does fairly well for a while and the business keeps climbing. Yeah. And then if you don't work at it real hard, it's going to go into steep decline and wow, and may fall apart. Love. Almost all businesses do eventually fall apart. So yeah. and yeah, I think most loves do fall apart. Mm. I, you know, I used to see my parents. My parents were together for geez. <laughs> until my dad died in 1988. So they were together almost 50 years. But, but I watched, you know, as a, I was born in 1946, and I, I, I watched their love, you know, reach kind of a peak, and then it just disappeared. It kind of disappeared, mm-hmm. you know, and, they, and instead of love, there was coexistence. Yeah. And, you know, kind of like, you know, it's, it's just easier for us to keep a checking account, easier for us to do this. Oh, wow. And... Well, you know, well, that's we're, where the we're, media comes in, though. Well, not just the media. We're emotionally untrained. Most of us don't know how to express our emotions. Most of us are not very honest about them, mm. and that's culture bound. You know, we come from we come from cultures that, you know, especially the Anglo-Saxon work ethic. You know, keep your keep your feelings inside. Yeah. If you but if you come from a French family, an Italian family, you know, you're much more likely, or a Spanish family, uh, you're much more likely to be open and honest and, and it doesn't mean the other ones are dishonest. Right. Tell that just, to the Bellavias. Just call, yeah, like the Bellavias well, <laughs> and the Priatis and the Marinos. So, and, so it's, there's truth to that. So because you're a media scholar, I wanted to bring this. Right. I did my homework this weekend and last night I watched two movies uh, about cultural differences like you're discussing. Sure. So one is uh, The Feast of Seven Fishes, which came out in 2019 and it's about an Italian family right. in Pittsburgh. I never heard of it and I loved it. I loved it so much and it was that just rich, you know, communication and it was I think it was four brothers which you can relate to. Yeah, you have a lot of brothers. brothers. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and I have four children, so I really resonate with that. And I come from a family of, um, my dad is one of seven. So it's a huge yeah. Sparks family every year. And we Southerners are very much like what you described with the Italians and the other cultures you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Very expressive, very boisterous, very loud. And there was always so much love being expressed. And I was formerly married to a man whose uh, mother was Norwegian. Mm-hmm. Very, like, quiet. A little more tight, tight. Yeah, did, highly intellectual, mm-hmm. um, but very reticent. And just, they didn't say, I love you. There was no hugging and kissing on the cheeks. Right. And so when I had my children, she actually commented one time about, you're just spoiling the kids. You're just like, they're going to just expect that all the time. <laughs> and I said, well, they're going to get that all the time. It's not like I'm going to pull it back one day and go, ah, yeah. you know, you don't no more love for you. Right, right, you know? right. And so I, I do have um, that different expressiveness that you spoke about. But in the movie, there was a cultural difference where the, the girl um, comes home from college and she's the, you know, the um, breaking up their boyfriend and her mother wants her to be with the country club boy. And right. she meets this artist whose family is Italian, and she said in the film, you know, they're they're great, hardworking people, but they're not like us. Not and, like us. And yeah. she just rejected that. And the boy falls for her, right. and the Italian family accepted her willingly, like, oh, she's great, she's wonderful, except the grandmother. The grandmother wanted her to marry a nice Italian girl, nice Italian. wanted him to marry yeah. a nice Italian girl. So I thought that was interesting. And then the next film was, and I'm going to forget the name of it, but it's about an Indian man marrying a Norwegian girl. It's mm. on Netflix right now. Um Gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's the same sort of thing where his culture was extremely expressive and even the food, uh, the food was really spicy and expressive. Right. And then they stick in the Nor- they go to Norway for Christmas and they stick to that routine. Like we always do this on Christmas. We always do this. Right. And they're not the they're rigid. They're, they're not rigid. willing right. to change. And so I thought about that. How much in real life is the media depicting it as a as a media professor? Are there ways in which the media gets it right with love? Are there ways to get it wrong? Well, we're then, just celebrating. Uh, it's a, that's a great question. We're just celebrating the uh, the great life of Norman Lear. Yeah. One of the things exactly. Norman Lear brought to American television and his honesty, a lot yeah. more honesty about, you know, before 
before Norman Lear, the, you know, we saw the Leave it to Beaver and the Brady Bunch and, you know, they were unrealistic portrayals of stereotypical creatures who don't really exist in the real world. Yeah. And then along comes Archie Bunker and the whole family and they're kind of real. Yeah. And it He's, was, it was the, co- the, the, the reason they coincided too was, you know, there was people like Martin Luther King yeah. and Gloria Steinem. They were just rattling cages all over the place. Yeah. Right. Well, it brings up a question. So Archie Bunker, when I saw him as a kid, I think... I probably saw it as reruns. I'm not right. sure if yeah, I saw the young. original. I don't know. I, I may not be. I don't know. But I, or, I think it was, the in the 70s. It was in the 1970s. Yeah, yeah, yeah so that's 70, when I would have I've seen the YouTube clips. Yeah. <laughs> the, first, the first year, I think, was 71 or 72. Okay. 71, 72. So I would have seen it in the reruns. Yeah, and We saw the real ones. We hmm. did. We yeah. did. Okay. Cause I couldn't remember when it was airing, but seventy one, seventy two. I know. I say. I think it stayed on for seven seasons. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I did not see it at the beginning because we didn't have a TV until I was in fourth grade. Oh, you didn't so. have a TV. That's no, we didn't have a TV. Boy, I grew up really c- poor. <laughs> cultural, cultural so, deprived. So yeah. I got a TV when I would have been around ten. So anything right. I saw for TV was at my grandparents or at school. Mm-hmm. And so I remember seeing Archie Bunker, and my first reaction. Was I was terrified. I was so afraid of that man. Terrified of him. Yes, yes his oh, character. Yeah. Yeah, his yeah, character yeah, sure. really scared me. And I always thought that his way of expressing himself was abusive to Edith. Yeah, well, it was. It, you know, <laughs> it, so it really I'm, was. So, so look at that. If if then he would, they would show him later. And when um, I hate to use this phrase, but he called his son-in-law Meathead. 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 Yeah. He called his son-in-law Rob Reiner, right. uh, one of the greatest artists of our time, in my <laughs> opinion. I think he's wonderful. Um, he would say something that would get to Archie Bunker. And then by the end of certain episodes, you would see a little bit of resentful, reg- like he didn't want to give it, but there was a little bit of love and understanding coming from mm-hmm. Archie Bunker towards Edith, especially. So one of the most, what you're talking about, one of the most important functions of the mass media is to set the agenda of things we're supposed to be talking about. Mm-hmm. Things that are supposed to be important to us. Is that a function or is that an effect? It's both. So they, it's a function there's an and, and it's so there's an intention sure. there. Okay. Let's say I'm William Matar advertising. Okay. You know, everybody in Rochester knows who William Matar. Yes. Everybody in upstate New York knows William Matar. Yes. So his point is, if you get into a car accident, call me. Yeah. I'm probably going to help you get rich, mm-hmm. allegedly. Yeah. Uh, but the agenda setting is, it, it used to be there was a very small group of people that we call gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden the gatekeepers got out of control. Mm-hmm. Or the gatekeepers lost control. They failed people to keep. <laughs> well, they, they couldn't control the content anymore. Mm. You know, and, until uh, you know, my students used to ask me, they'd say, when did people start cursing in, in films? Well, they started cursing in films in the 1960s because we finally kind of got rid of the MPAA, the Motion Picture mm. uh, Association, yeah. which was largely controlled by the Catholic Church. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was a priest who who drew up all the you know all the pl- all the plans. Are you for- kidding? No, I did I'm, not. I know wish that. I was kidding. Wow. No, they were, I mean we're a puritanical culture too. Yeah. And fascinatingly, I come from my grandparents were all from two from Sicily and two from Italy, mm-hmm. and I watched them all buy into kind of a Calvinistic Protestant work ethic, mm-hmm. which wasn't Italian at all. To work yeah. eight hours straight during the day, or work yeah. ten hours straight mm-hmm. during the day, and not take a break for lunch, and not sit down with your family. It was so anti-culture, yeah. and what it did is cause a lot of anxiety. Yeah, and when you when you produce that kind of rub, be, I, w- I would strongly recommend sometime you get a, a sociologist or an anthropologist to come we out. Have, and, we have, we okay, have. Okay, yeah, talk, yeah, talk, talk about this kind of rub that's going on right now. No, another thing that happened is, you know, in the early 1960s, I knew I wanted, I was going to do news for a while, so I was a TV newsman for. Two and a half, three years. Yeah. But I also worked in a newspaper for four years. Mm. And I, I watched the civil rights movement mm. take place. And I watched the true genius of managing the media was Martin Luther King. Yeah. And what, he, what did he preach? He preached love. He yeah. preached love and understanding and tolerance yeah. and whatever. And What would he think today? Would he think that his message didn't last? Oh, no, no, no. We are, we've had a lot of ch- there, There'd be a massive amount of change. Is there enough change? No. I mean, just, you know, and there really never is enough change. Yeah. One of the things we know about every every culture, every society, especially when it rubs up against something like a new media form. Yeah, you know, I'm sitting here holding this thing here. Yeah. I'll never forget my very bright son. In 2008, we both got our first iPhones. Mm-hmm. And he said, this is a game changer <laughs> because you don't need to build infrastructure. 
Oh. All you need are cell phone towers. You don't have to run wires anywhere. Yeah. But people yeah. are so anti-social media, and I actually use it in, a, I think, a positive way. So I can keep up with what my kids are into, and so I don't have to, like, grill them for what they want for Christmas. I can actually look. Sure. Um, but so, you know, I don't know. If, I wouldn't call a phone social media, but technology. And so this morning, and my daughter lives in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. She's a musician and actress out there on, and videographer, producer. And they're, they had a power outage. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think, 2.30 in the morning for her. And all of a sudden, my phone rings, and it you know just wakes me up. It was 5.30 here. And it's never good if your kids are calling right. you at 5.30 right. in the morning. Yep. And she was, you know, in tears and like it had been dark and she didn't have her phone wasn't properly charged. I'm like, Madison, a good Girl Scout is always prepared. And, <laughs> she, goes, and she goes, you didn't let me do Girl Scouts. <laughs> that was her answer. But I did for a little while. But um, I stayed with her on the phone for two hours until the power came back on. I was checking the USGS, mm -hmm. the U.S. Geological um, Society. Yeah, I, guess. They have a, I think this they had a lot of rain earth, last night. They did. Yeah. And I don't we still don't know what caused it. But there was a minor earthquake in two different places. So right. There was two. I'm like, well, I lived out there for 10 years. It couldn't be that. And then I said, you know, maybe a transformer blew. Right. And she said there was loud noises. There was people out in the streets shining flashlights. So she was scared. Sure. I was exhausted. I had stayed up late because I'm on vacation now. I'm like, oh, I can stay up late. I don't have to get up tomorrow morning early. Boom. When you have a kid, you're agreeing to like be there for them. And mm -hmm. so I was thinking about as I was driving over here. Yes, I needed to sleep, but I stayed on the phone with her for two hours. You know why hours. you stayed on the phone with her? Because love. Yeah. You love's, know? Love's powerful. It, it is. truly is powerful. And by the way, you just said something. You, you think most people think social media are negative or... Oh, I hear so uh, much. But think that's about... That's only because, you know, all media forms are neutral. Yeah. We yeah, put like we that. put the value in there. You know, the, Marshall McLuhan, the great communication theorist, used to say the medium is the message. And people still, most people still don't understand what that means. Most people don't even hear it anymore. But the, all the, all the simply stated, it means, you know, once you introduce any new medium into a culture, it tends to shape the way the culture thinks. Mm -hmm. That started with human language. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're all uh, victims of our language. If you speak English as your only language, you tend to see the world mm. in the limitation of, you know, the, the number of words and the way we express things and, and whatnot. And then we hear people like... Uh, but I have a lot of French family as well. My French family and my Itali the people who live in Italy, my Italian relatives, they're so expressive. Yeah. And well, their language allows that. Yeah. But their language is also not, not nearly as good as English was for things like science, mm -hmm. things like landing an airplane. You know, why do we think we, we decided, oh, let's use English in, in air control power mm. uh, towers. It's, you know, it's a very precise it's language, precise. not as precise as German. German. Yeah. 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 So if you've been to Germany, you know how precise I'm everything is there. Yeah. Well, I worked with a German company. Yeah. And German has a, has a word for grief bacon. So. <laughs> 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 but I worked with a German company and they would get really upset if we were, Americans tend to start Zoom meetings like, oh, we'll give them another minute or two. Germans are like, oh, start on time. As soon as, as start on time. And they would get like visibly upset. So. Well, your sense of time, all of our senses of time are culture Bound. Yeah, We're, we are taught. So if, if, if you're in Spain or in Italy and somebody says, says, I want to have you come to my house tonight for dinner. And you say, what time? And they say seven o'clock. They don't really mean seven o'clock. <laughs> that would be hard for me. They would mean eight, eight, eight or eight thirty. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. goodness. It's, it's culture bound. Yeah. But if we say it in the United States, we don't even mind if you show up 20 minutes early. And the Germans yeah. are the same way. Yeah. And that's what I mean about we as Americans. Yeah. Even me as you know, I'm a second generation Italian American. Yeah. But. I watched my dad open, you know, he had a restaurant that opened every day from eight and closed at two in the morning. Wow. And I used to sit, sit there, you know, when I took my first anthropology course, it kind of blew my brain apart. I was like, wow, how did, how did they get us to buy into this? Well, it was the ticket to acceptance. And that's, you know, the ticket to acceptance is a form of love. I mean, it really yeah. is. It's like, I just accepted you into my culture. Yeah. Now, does that mean... You know, and any love relationship, all relationships have have ups and downs. Yeah. And it, we have to learn how to negotiate the ups and downs. And for the most part, think about your elementary school training. Not only did you not get trained 
in media. You did not get trained in finances, how no. to pay your taxes, how to invest your money. You also did not get trained in interpersonal communication. The most basic things in the world, the things you and I but are talking about. But I learned how right to now. solve for X and I'm still waiting to <laughs> yep. use it. Yep, like, there it is. So I, I always used to make the joke that trigonometry was trig oh not for me. Yeah, no, trig oh not for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I have, my daughter and I both feel very firmly that it was just wasted years of my life. Right. I had, I have a research degree from UCLA and so mm-hmm. I had to take an entire Entire year of just math. All the stats, right? Yeah. It was the worst year of my life. Of I course. can say that I'm a domestic violence survivor, and it was still the worst year of my life because it was so foreign to how my brain works, and mm-hmm. I've not used it yet. And I work in research. You probably use it more than you thought. Not directly, but but it shouldn't be the it shouldn't be the absolute foundation of who we are. The absolute foundation of who we are should be self knowledge, and we don't yeah. teach that. But if we love our students, let's speak about love oh, and God, education. I love, I love my students. I know if we love our students as an educational institution. Why would we say that you have to go through a cookie cutter program in order to graduate? Why can't we do something where you choose a tract? And I'm talking elementary right. and middle school. Like I had no interest in algebra. Right. I don't use it. I have never used it. And I have wasted literally years, probably two years. Right. And not even tangentially have I yeah. ever, ever used it. Chemistry, never, never once have used it. Um, well, it, it could be a me. blessing in disguise, though, because like you're looking at that and you're like, do I really need that? Maybe it's it's creating that. Maybe it, it's it's in influencing that sort of intuitive mindset that you have. That it's like, oh, yeah, maybe could, maybe you know, I don't need it. Just reduce my GPA. But I, I'm going to reduce my GPA. Right. And, and I'm going to bring it back to something else. We thought what Henry Ford did for the automobile, building things on an assembly line. Mm-hmm would work in education. Mm. So we adopted that model pretty early on. And also, you know, you think about the the first public education in the United States happened around 1850. Yeah. So you could, there were almost always small rooms. There weren't a lot of children in school. We didn't allow blacks Mm. in school at all. We didn't want them reading because Mm. we knew reading, reading's really powerful stuff. If you could read it, Mm. you know, read, read that, that history of Frederick Douglass. Yeah. One of the real keys to the brilliance. One of the real, he was actually (laughs) Maryland where where he's from. But he came here. Well, one of the brilliant, brilliant aspects of this guy was he could read Mm. and, you know, slaves were not allowed to read. Mm. They would, but think about the model now of education. Now no one can read. Now everyone's <laughs> well, on social media. Yeah, now that's, no one and can that's read. An, uh, that's Did another you hear what myth. he just said? He yeah. said because of social media. But no, I disagree no, no. with that. So it's what he said earlier really we're, we're resonated with We're reading more than we me. ever have. I was watching. So this morning, I'm like you talked about scrolling. I'm having my coffee, and I'm just so exhausted because my you know I was up with my daughter. Right. And there was a, a reel on, and it showed an upper cut of the screen and a lower cut. And it was t- the same couple, but they showed them in the same scenario but with different sp- responses as couples. The upper um, screen was a couple whose marriage works. And the lower screen was a couple whose marriage becomes roommates, like you said earlier. Right. And so the first one was they're sitting at a table. The man's sitting at a table. He's got his back to the camera. And she comes and she just sits beside of him, but she doesn't touch him. The upper couple, the woman comes in, he looks at her, they eye gaze, yeah. and he sits down, he rubs her back, yeah. and, and then she rubs his back. And so that's the first scenario. The next scenario is they're passing each other in the hallway of their home, and he's got a laundry basket, and she's got some papers in her arm, and they just pass each other and yeah, don't two look. Two ships passing in the, the night. And then the, the upper frame shows them seeing each other, smiling, eye contact, and then kissing and keeping on going. Right. And they said that what really makes love not have the peak, but, you know, continues to have a steady arc is that frequent regeneration. Like, yeah, you have you to know. keep sparking it over and over again. Yeah, and I was thinking about that. So in the um, research degree I have, we worked in a rat lab and we had um, a, a Did the rats read? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But no. Rat yeah. labs on yeah, rat they, campuses and they are very funny. And they couldn't solve for X. But she fell no. in. They couldn't solve for X. No, but what we did was we trained them to be addicted to something. Right. And it was a variable schedule. But it doesn't seem to work in marriage. If if I nine mm. times out, of, or let's say six times out of ten, the, my partner is going to respond positively, but the other four he doesn't. I'm going to say, "Hey, dude, you're inconsistent," and I'm looking for consistency. Yeah, we call that instrumental behavior, by the way. Instrumental it, behavior. Well, it's, you know, you're going to you're going to you're going to keep going back to the thing that makes you feel good about who you are. Yeah. You know, and if and, and if you don't. You know, just think about the what happens over a long period of time. If that's if that's the pattern that continues. At some at some point, it just it disappears. It just goes away. Love is, you know, love and relation. Both of them, love and relationships, are not the same thing. Mm. But they really they're very hard work. Mm-hmm. And again, you, have you ever been taught that in school? Never. No. I mean, never once. No. Well, how do you teach ever. it? 
oh, interpersonal communication yeah. skills. Oh, game playing right off the bat. Mm. And then pointing out behavior, pointing out saying, oh, you know, that what you just did there was a really loving act. And what you just did there was not a loving act. Maybe it's I like that. emotional training is so critically emotional important. Training. Why can't that be? A, I've always thought because I raised four kids in a very large school system. Right. And I don't think it worked for my particular type of children. Absolutely um, not. It didn't work for them. Because you have an autistic child, right? I do. And yeah. and also, I grew up in a small town, and my graduating class was under 100. Right. And I'm still in connection with all my professors, all my teachers. Sweet. Even at UCLA, which is a large institution, mm-hmm. I'm still in touch with several. But that's part of my personality I would say that's type. a lot of that is you. Yeah. yeah. But with my kids, because there's definitely um, you know some autism going on, they needed to be in a smaller school system. Sure. And I always thought, wouldn't it be great if we taught what you just described? Like, how to be a good human. How to be a good human being. How to be a good human. And not that my kids the, are great The, the problem with that, though, is that it's subjective because pe- people in their own There's mind. Basic. It's actually well, no. not. Well, no, but it is, though, because a lot of people have their own. Like, like, even people who are doing what you would consider the wrong thing in their head think it's good. That's the problem that's with that, though. That's what the instructions for. And then you, but, but, but that's when you start negotiating. It's no different than well, law. Right. It's no different than law. It, I mean, it's... Ex- see, I'm a communication person. And one of the things that one of the things that I learned, especially I was a chemistry major as an undergraduate. Get out. I was no a, way. Yeah, I was a chemistry that did major. Not I'm, see I'm a that coming at all. I'm, an, I'm a STEM and, person. Wow. But I took I was forced to take an anthropology class. Mm. And the guy I had as a teacher was such a great human. In fact, he's still in my life. I send him mm. an email every day. He's 97 years old. And I send him an I email. Love that. And with the emails are now jokes. That I, send I need to start to doing that. Julian, That's a good idea. Julian, are you, are you still alive yet? And he writes back to me and he goes, Are you are still you? alive? And he writes back to me and he goes, Are you, you guys, I guess you're still alive yet. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're also still alive. But this guy taught me so much. He, he taught anthropological linguistics. And I had never thought about human language. Yeah. And all of a sudden this guy's dropping in my brain. And I was in a class with nine students, eight of them were anthropology majors and me, the chemistry major who just needed a sociology class or a social studies class to complete my core. And the stuff he taught me about human communication was just mind blowing. I would sit there like this and then I would go to his office afterward and he was one of the most welcoming human beings. And people would say, well, did he always make you feel good about everything? He he knows. A lot of times he would tell me I was full of crap, (laughs) you know, and and that I had to get get rid of these prejudices. And and I felt just the same way you did. I'd say, well, you know, so much of communication is emotional. And he'd say, well, yeah, it is, but you can still talk about it and you can probably still work it out. He said, that's the problem nowadays is you can't. Yes, you can. You can talk. Well, I mean, I would say I would say in our modern society, it's it's a lot harder because there is that a lot of that stigma of like the lack of communication has created such a I mean, it's, it's created yeah, such a Yeah, but one dogma. of the things you're, you're hitting right there Evan, is, is the lack of communication. The, the fact that you could just make that statement means that we're talking about it. And that's fantastic. That's oh no, I, I agree. This I is think, what the podcast is about today. Is absolutely. It? I think we should have we should be able to communicate like even if like we like if. God forbid somebody disagrees with what, 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 for what, whatever. I'm not really a right. political person. I could like. Not true. I, yeah, Absolutely not all, true. He's lying to you right now. <laughs> I'm not a political person at all. We're all political. I am not. No, I'm not. I always, you hear, I always are used you to make this. Are you capturing this guy? He's lying on camera. <laughs> I'm not lying on camera. I used to Absolutely. make this joke. It's like, what do you get when you have a Republican father and a, and a, and a Democrat mother? You have someone who doesn't give a shit. Uh, and that's me. I, I'm, it's, it's, I mean, I, I shouldn't say I, I, it's not that I don't care. It's just like I don't have a distinct. I, I look at, at things with like a bit of a nuance. I right. look at both sides of the thing. And I think most people should. But the problem is, though, is a lot of people that a lot of people are very tribal, especially in America. They're, yeah. they're incredibly tribal. and they, They'll pick one well, side. It's very or the other. smart to be tribal because you can't really manage an, an enormous group. It's, so you, you try to keep it. Set. What's scary is not tribal is silo. So if you get yes. stuck in the silo and I, I watched two minutes of, I really can't watch local TV news anymore. And I can't, I can listen to XX. I work and it. I know and, how you feel. I, yeah. It's just garbage. I mean, the, the first thing last night and that was on in two minutes was something about a stabbing that took place someplace. Oh. That's not news. You remember what John just, Lennon said know, about that? What's that? John Lennon. You remember what oh, he yes. said? Yeah. He said, I get all the news I need from the weather report. From or the is weather. that maybe the Simon yeah. and Garfunkel song? Yeah. No. And, and it's both actually. Yeah. But think about, you know, talk about setting the agenda. Mm -hmm. So most Americans think crime is on the increase. Yes. Crime has been decreasing for 40, 50 years. Because it sells, right? Well, it's just been decreasing like crazy. But that's my point, though, is that people will look at a piece of media, whether whether it's to one side or the other, they'll look at that, but it'll it'll feed into their own bias. Exactly. And and if if we taught them media literacy, 
But they wouldn't get that, though. That's my yeah, point. Yeah, they would. No, they wouldn't. Because, yeah, some you know, I, like, I have to tell you a real quick story about I worked in the advertising business for one and a half years, 18 months. I left work. I, I taught at St. John Fisher. I went to work for Time Warner, the company today we call Spectrum. I was the VP of marketing. And then I took a buyout. I, I left. I worked at an ad agency for about 15, 16 months. And one of the things I realized very quickly is when I started talking to my advertising colleagues, they would tell you that if you're doing advertising in Canada or the UK, it has to be far more sophisticated because those people have been taught media literacy. In the United States, much easier. it's much easier to sell garbage to us. And by the way, take a look at our landfills and you'll know. Oh, take yeah. a look at the, what's going on right now with shopping and Christmas and, and whatnot. You know, we've become the marketing culture. We've become a consumer culture. Most of it is blind consumption. Well, it's, it's content. Not, it's, it's, it's just you're well, just that's taking a good content. Point. It's all kinds of things. It's, it's, if, if, if I can control your attention and if I can I – mean, you're working local news. How many mm-hmm. times have the consultants said to you, we really have to scare the crap out of the audience? That's how we keep them there. Well, they haven't told me that specifically, but it's like... It, well, they're telling your news director. Yeah. Well, the, <laughs> the, the, me, well I, the, one th- the one thing, though, is it, it's uh, with, with news is you ha- it, it's not like, like you're not making this, like whenever you're editing, like, because I edit a lot of the stories. Right. You can't just, it's not like you're not making Star Wars here. You have to kind of just get whatever base footage you got. Because I, I a great line. I started as a, oh, well, it is because no, it, I know. And it taught me a lot because I, I started out as a, um, as a news, as a news photojournalist. That's, that's and then that, yeah. I okay. became like a, a technical director director and an editor uh, over here at, at Channel A. Shout out to Channel A. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the things that I, what, that I learned, though, is like it, it, not only is it, it, I wouldn't say basic in terms of like the editing style, but it's like it, it gets the point across because the difference between right. a news audience and a, you know, a film and television audience is that you're not following a continuity. You have to basically just get the facts and you're out absolutely there right the about facts. it. But one of the things I'm going to tell you right now is you have so few people under the age of 50 who watch anything you guys do. Oh, for sure. They're yeah. not watching at all. And that's one of the greatest hopes for America is they're much more likely getting news in a safer place, at least, than what get, gets local, presented on TV. Is Local is, news has a function. Though. Like you said earlier, there's a function it serves. And I think I like to know if there is, you know, there was a, a restaurant I used to go to all the time right. um, when I worked in a laboratory called Trio. And they had a, a young woman shot, and she was killed. Mm-hmm. And this is like a really nice area of town. Yeah, West I felt, I felt completely safe at night there. And now I'm like, oh, that was a function of the local media informing me. Yes. So there is a oh, role. No, they, they inform. But the problem is that's... It's all out of whack, it's, though. It's, exactly. <laughs> it's they're, it's they're, so far out of whack. But and it's a survival instinct, isn't it? tell you the news hole 12 minutes? The actual news hole? Uh, wait, say that again? The news hole. The actual news oh, hole. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's 12 minutes. But is it about... 12 out of 30. Is, is it is that. it about sensationalism? Yes. Yes. Well, it's also in blocks, but it's also too. about yeah, it's done in blocks, survival. It, and and the same thing with with love. Everything at the base of it, like when a baby's born, it's all about survival, right? It's all sure. about survival. So maybe there's some you know connection there. There was all kinds but of even, connections. But even what you said earlier, um, getting back to the landfill. So my mom, and I don't know where this comes from because she was raised poor. She one year they couldn't give us the type of Christmas presents that, right. you know, she felt we needed the number, the volume, the keeping up with the Joneses. Cause she saw it in the media. Yep. She saw those big commercials where the family has the big tree and there's like a thousand presents under the tree. And so even though we were poor, we had huge Christmases. I don't know how sure. my parents afforded that. Well, and they then, probably didn't. They probably bought on credit. Probably. But one year they couldn't. Credit cards. And my mom cried because they couldn't I just got do one. it. <laughs> they do wonders. They're evil. They're they really evil. do. They're evil. Stay away from those. They, um, I love But live within your means. But anyway, uh, she couldn't do it one year. And I remember her saying, you guys are going to think that we don't love you. Wow. And I'm like, mom, oh, I'm a kid here. How am I parenting here? But she really had bought into that media blitz of Christmas is, you know, you get a new car and you get a new car. Like I, yeah. it, that, I hate that. They didn't watch the Grinch. I don't think they watched the Grinch. <laughs> yeah. Or Charlie Brown. Where or the, Charlie or Brown. The light, there's a show right now on TV, Tom, where I think love gets, love is wrong in the media, the way they media portrays it in this regard. They're saying that show your love for Christmas by making more light display than your neighbors. Yes. And I'm like, Somewhere, Charlie Brown That's is insane. turning over in his grave. Snoopy, <laughs> remember Snoopy won the contest, and he goes, even my dog's gone commercial. I hate that stuff. And I also, the, another thing about love in the media, it just makes me cringe, is those pr- uh, proposals in public. I hate that 
I hate that so much. So what is, as a media professor, how do you feel about those things, like the contest or the public proposals, which to me are just like, look at me and how good I am. Gender, you know? re- gender revealed. Oh, yeah. yeah same, same kind of thing. Well, you, you can, it's all been marketed. You know, yeah. I, one of the first things I would tell every class I ever taught is 98% of what you're doing when you live in the United States is marketing. Mm. And you're the, you're either part of the process or you're being you're you know, you're either the the dog or the the tail getting wagged by the dog or you're, you're the product or you're the leash you're like you're you're the or, the, or the poopy yeah you may, you know it, it, and it's all market I mean so much of what we have on is marketing look at the shirt I have on it says Adidas you know, <laughs> I spe- I gave them thirty bucks to wear their advertising oh wow and you know it, it, so much of what we do is driven by marketing and. I would love to think that I'm so smart because I'm media literate. I'm yeah. probably a little bit more media literate than most folks, right. simply because it was my field. I would certainly yeah. hope so. Cause you're, <laughs> well, I, I would hope so too. But are there times when I didn't spend when I spent money that right, I didn't yeah. have? Sure, absolutely. Are there times when I felt guilty because I didn't give something to someone? I mean, something. One of the I think one of the pow- most powerful things my wife and I ever did was. At 16 and, and 15, 16, 15, we did our first Christmas together and also Aww. her birthdays on Christmas Eve. Aww. Well, I gave her a sweater that I heard her say to one of her siblings. <laughs> She's the oldest of 11, by the way. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. She walked into the other room and she said, look what Tom gave me. She goes, it's just atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> and then the well, thing, you're only human. That's well, not I you know, one of the things we, Can I borrow is, this? Because I have where, an ugly absolutely. sweater. I have an ugly Christmas sweater party to go to and I don't Well, this is where the, on, the honesty of our relationship <laughs> comes in is because I said to her, I said, you know what, maybe it's, maybe we don't need this exchange of gifts. Yeah. So we've never given each other gifts for Christmas. Oh, wow. By the way, I wouldn't know how to wrap a gift anyway. <laughs> I, you know, I'm really I'm terrible. terrible. I'm all gifts. thumbs. Gift bags. And I don't want to feel guilty about it. I just don't, you know, it just troubles me to see people say, I have to buy so-and-so But a maybe gift. it's not you buy say you the have... gift, you're giving her a gift by well, being uh, a good husband, being yeah. a good life partner. Well, that's what I, we remind each other of that every single yeah, day. Yeah. And that's, oh. that comes from the communicator. That's, yeah. I'm the communicator. I talk to everybody. I collect people. I, I love life. I think every moment is so absolutely precious. Mm. And I'm constantly reminded the two of us. Now, my wife is a breast cancer survivor two times, oh, I didn't know that. two strokes, two knee replacements, lost her spleen in a car accident, wow. needs a shoulder replacement. This woman is so amazing. She's a bionic woman. Well, and also think about, <laughs> think, <laughs> about woman. But think about the test of our relationships. Yeah. And every time she has had an illness, yeah. because one of, one of the first things that happened, you know, think about you know, when women become pregnant, yeah. you become the center of attention. Hmm. And then when the baby shows up, you're not. Yeah, I never and thought about it that what way. What happens to the husband? He disappears. Yeah. You know, and there, a lot of a lot of bad relationships happen right there. We should have a we should have an NFL referee run right into the middle of it and say, <laughs> "You better start paying attention to the, your wife, yeah. and you bet, better start paying to, attention to your Five husband." Five yard penalty. Well, actually, that's a good yard point. penalty, roughing the passer, <laughs> what you know, whatever, personal oh, foul. Yeah, one of the things that happened in my marriage was I how a person makes you feel is going to determine whether or not you're going to stay with them. And well, when, most marriages break up because of money, but that's yeah. Well, I mean, fe- that was the feeling, factor. Feelings count as well. well to, well, to was, bring up your point earlier, though, because do you think it like they, most people find that out later in life? Because like far too often, yes. people will find a lot of stuff out, like uh, like find that stuff out about like each other, about how the, the most important thing is like each other, and they're like they find that out much later. Well, they met life. at fifteen and sixteen, so that probably well, helps. Well, it's also but also probably a different bring up too, because with my generation Absolutely. too, it's all like with with. Like all right, here's a, here's another quick mm-hmm. example. So my wife and I were married for two weeks, and then we we moved to Syracuse. A whole bunch of things happened in those first eight months that we were together, especially because we had never slept together, we had never spent an overnight together, mm. and all of a sudden we're in a different city. We're married. I'm 21. She's 20. And one of the things she said to me, I bounce out of bed in the morning with a smile on my face and I can't wait to make a bagel or make some toast and have the coffee. And she said, do you do this every day? <laughs> and I said, do what? And she said, you, you wake up and you're smiling and you're talking. And she's one of those people that doesn't want anybody talking to her mm. in the morning. And we had to work that out. <laughs> and now she's much more open to it. And I don't, I don't think I won her over, but I think what I did is we, we both have respect for the way we are when we realize that in the morning I can be happy. I love, I, I love listening to 
NPR in the morning. Mm. And for my wife, it's not nearly as important. She'd much rather have a little bit of quiet time yeah. with a cup of tea. I'm a breakfast eater. She's not a breakfast eater. I drink coffee. She drinks tea. You know, there's a whole slew of differences yeah. there. And she has a space in the house that's hers. And I have a space in the house that's, that's mine. And we do a lot of things separately. And we come back and share with each other yes. constantly. That's, she, I, think I come back key. with you know, I come back and say, I had I played golf today with three of the best guys in my life. Yeah. And she said, You did that yesterday too. And I said, <laughs> And what a gift it is. It just keeps on giving but over you have and over. Something to tell her. So one of the things I saw in the media recently was Cameron Diaz is married to Benji, somebody's a musician. I forgot the name of the band. And she said that they have um, they've been married a long time, mm-hmm. and the key for them is having separate bedrooms. And all I, these, I don't sleep with my wife. And all these, my grandparents didn't either yeah. because Papa tossed and turned, and it kept my yeah, grandma up. And my parents too. Like there's a difference. And she said that it's important to have that space so you have something to talk about at the end of the day, or you have a restful night's sleep. And I just thought that was fascinating. It's beautiful. And the, the, think about um, the Petries and um, the oh, TV show. Um, the Dick Van Dyke Show. Dick Van Dyke Show, oh, yeah. who who's had his 98th birthday celebration the other day, beautiful I heard. Yeah, I know. Um, but uh, He's still so but, young. He looks so young. He, he was good. with yes, it, too. He, he was following the show. Yeah. But they had, I remember thinking how strange it was that they had separate beds in the show, but they couldn't show it in the media back then. They couldn't well, they show, could. They just chose oh, not to. Oh, they chose that not the, to. That was the impact of Catholic church and christianity and and in general yeah is to Which not, don't you think they, they could not depict nor could they say the word pregnant oh now there was nothing about the law in that that hmm. was that was the dominance of the pure the puritan culture that existed in the united oh, because states because people are supposed to have all immaculate conceptions is yeah, that what pretty they? much yeah well, well that's that, you know, what, Nor- what norman lear did was blow that model up yeah and not only did he blow it up at one point there, there was a time when norman lear had of the top 10 shows that were on every week, he had seven. Wow. Seven of them were his shows. Yeah. And it turned out he drew m- more people. And the other thing that happened to him is he had more people talking about his content. It was quality after. writing. It was because really most good. of us, if you watch The Leave It to Beaver. today. Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't. You, I would, you keep you keep crapping on today. Yeah. And I, well, I, no, I because disagree it sucks with you. Because it, it, really, it really does suck. Because the, a, a lot of the problem with today's, um, whether it's, Whatever medium it is, it's content. It's you're not watching a television show. You're watching. Oh, you product. mean reality? Yeah. Well, not even reality shows, but like like look Which, at the streaming. Ser- well, look at the streaming services that are coming out. Some they're, of the best are- t- television of my life. Oh, get out of here! With, I agree for, with I, Tom. I agree with Tom. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is well, the, best, saying, well, this is the saying, golden age of television. Are you saying right in now? terms of have like, you seen Lessons in Chemistry or Ted Lasso? Ted Lasso is amazing. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, How about Lessons in Chemistry? Have you seen that? I have not seen. I've seen Made. There's oh, some of the be- really some of the good. best. The, this is the best media content of our human lifetime. But I think he's right. saying it's though, also available to everyone. Whereas, you know, even 50 years ago, my grandparents didn't read English. Mm. I, mm-hmm. You know, the, this is all available to every single one of us. And by the way, some of the coolest producers. Well, that's not starting to matter anymore. Because but a some lot of the of coolest the, producers in the world a lot of are the, people on TikTok. Who have right. no connections to the big media system. But how system. has it changed love? So if we go back. How does it let's change say, love? It redefines it constantly. Well, let's look at this. So it used to be you couldn't see any examples of anything except a heteronormative relationship right. with white people. And now you can see love in intergenerational oh, yeah. or different persuasions. Well, and that's so starting think, to change now, though, too, because it's not it's not just the American market. What, what's happening right. right now is the Asian market is Now he just dominating. hit on something. That, well, because, that, well, have you seen that, about that new Godzilla movie market. that just came out? Yeah. The new Godzilla movie? Yeah. It, $10 million budget quadrupled it within a couple of weeks. <laughs> Dude, most the of these films, oh, my God. Yeah. And most of these films that are coming out, they have $300 million budgets and they're bombing. Yes. Wow. They're bombing. And it took a, 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 a Japanese because, import that's not even in English. Yeah. And American audiences are coming in in droves and, to see this thing. And, uh, uh, it, it's a fantastic film, by the, the way. The impact of global culture is so profound at this point. And what it's causing is a lot of anxiety for all of us because we get bombarded by so many different systems of, of mores and what. But the other side of it is, if you've kind of been trained for it, like the first time I landed in England was 1989. And it's, I was there 20 minutes and I, I started believing in reincarnation because I said, why do I feel so comfortable here? Wow. No, and I, well, it was wow. almost it because was almost like I must have lived here before. I don't believe in reincarnation. But is it because you had seen it in the media? 
No, it was because I was experiencing it firsthand and I, you know, I didn't really know what it was like. And so what's happened, you know, just think about today, 3 million people are, are flying just around the United States. Mm-hmm. Imagine what's happening around the world today. And the, the exchange of culture and cultural values is just astonishing. And it, ha- it puts a great rub on us. And what are we teaching in school? Algebra. Yeah. Yeah. Huge mistake. I mean, we, we, and if you think about the classroom of 1850 and the classroom of 1870 and the classroom of 2023, 2024, still pretty much the same. It's the only thing that hasn't really changed. And a lot of that is just, you know, it's difficult to change our social structures. Yeah. It's difficult to, to, to reintroduce or introduce new content. Think about if, if we, what if I created an elementary school? And you know, we're going to teach in this. We're not just going to teach reading. We're going to teach TV production. Mm. We're going to teach podcasting. We're that was also, my major too, film, we're film also, production. And we're going to oh. teach, you know, we're going to teach love. We're going to teach love and life and happiness. And we're going to try to figure out why people are unhappy. We're going to talk about things that were have been taboo forever. You know, I, I tell people I'm 78 years old. I'm going to die soon. And almost the, the well, see, people well, respond no, but that it's way. Gonna, but it's, it's going to okay. happen. Yeah, it's, it's gonna going happen. to happen. And, and I'm okay with sad, it. Well, while it's sad, though, it's you can't deny the fact that it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And it may happen sooner than you think because life is very unpredictable. Here, my high school class had 381 students in it. Wow, that's Class huge. of 1963, right? I was the president of the class. Wow, well, I didn't know There's that. 180 of us left. Wow. Think about that. And wow. since we turned 75, we lose two a week. Two a week. And almost oh, all males. Crap. Wow. So think about that. But one of the good things news bits is I asked my primary care physician, who's one of the coolest guys in the world, Dave Stornelli. I said, David, were there, was there anything in medical school you weren't prepared for? And he sat there and he goes, yeah, I never expected to be taking care of so many 90 year olds. Wow. Wow. So we do have a huge number of 90 year olds. And, and how do we treat most of our 90 year olds? It's terrible. Yeah. Have you been in a nursing home lately? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, my grandma perished in one and I told my mother. They're awful. I told my mother, said, that's not happening to you. What, I said, if you have to move to New York, so be it. But that's not going to happen. And that's another thing. Like in the media, there's not a whole lot of how we love the elderly. And they're not, they're not existent. The Golden Girls was an outlier. They're invisible. Such an outlier, right? right? Almost all those Hallmark movies, which I admit I'm addicted to, and I know they're formulaic, so get off my back, Tom. I know. <laughs> no. <laughs> they are all young people. They don't ever have someone my age. I am not finished. Or if they do, you're a buffoon. Am, or I'm the mother. I am not finished mother. loving. Or the grandmother. I, I mean, the whole reason I'm doing this podcast is because I really want to you know, introspective. I'm going to be introspective and see where I contribute. To so my question for you yeah. is, do you think we can teach love? Or, well, aware, or do you mean love or awareness? I think we can love. teach loving actions. I don't think we can teach love because there are some people who are on death row that have the empathy chip missing from their brain and they are fundamental Absolutely narcissists true. and right. they have um, their frontal, their frontal sure. lobes are lacking impulse control. They're outliers. And yes, they are outliers. Right. And there's no way you can teach love love. Um, but I think you can teach loving actions to children and I think that you can model it. And, you know, do you think we could do better if, what if, what if we went from class sizes of, you know, typical class size in New York state right now, I think it's 22 to one. Yeah. What if the class size went down to four? Four. Interesting. Four to one. I know Allendale Columbia does that. What if we treated and funded education the same way we fund the military? We spend $4.2 billion a day and the American military, 60% of that goes to private corporations. Yeah. You know what we spend on education? One fifth, never one stop, fifth of that. that. But do you know what? One we're, fifth we're, of that. We're swimming but in that's anonymity. Marketing. We're swimming in anonymity. And so because I went to a small school and I saw the way my children's school was, there's there's more anxiety in Generation Z and Evan's generation yeah, than there has there been is. before. Some of it's because we have social media and we can compare ourselves more easily than before. But I also think that we we feel so disconnected from the school system. It's just a huge sea. There's the schools now are little cities like the Churchville school system where my kids right. went. Thousands of students and. It's just no way to connect. So and what if we'd reduce class size? I've always it, argued that. What and if we I, opened what, what if we didn't, what if there weren't grades? Do you know what I, say, I actually saw that? What if we actually taught to, te- to learning levels instead of piling people into grades saying, oh, you were born in 1946, you have to stay with the people who well, were born I in 1946. I asked Mayor Bob Duffy this question when I worked at the Democrat and Chronicle. I was on mm-hmm. the editorial board. I said his mother was a teacher, and I didn't know that when yeah, I asked he, him this question. I said, at what point are we losing students? He goes, we start to lose them in sixth grade. 
And I said, how do you know that? He goes, I asked my mother, and she's an educator for decades. And I started thinking about that. Sixth grade is when you move from the sweet elementary schools where you have the connections until you move into middle well, my and My wife was schools. a kindergarten teacher for 20 years, and she said, and she taught mostly inner city poor kids. And she said most of them were already lost already because lost. they had no, they By did, the time the system goes in, it's already too late. Well, it's already lost in the first five years of their lives. They haven't been loved. They, they've well, lived in a, a level of deprivation yeah. brought on by poverty. Where if you put 10 people in a small, you know, my wife and I live in 1,500 square feet. I sleep in separate bedrooms. You want to read a great book? Read Invisible Child by Andrea Elliott. And it'll tear your heart out, your heart out because you realize the level of poverty that we've allowed to happen in the United States. And by the way, poverty is a policy choice. We have decided it's okay oh, for absolutely. a certain percentage of our population to be hungry, underfed, to be so you're saying our government you know doesn't much love. The, you're saying our government doesn't express love. I don't even no. know what do that know, is. Do you do you it's, do you know how much the the Bills Stadium costs? Ay, ay, ay. Let's not even the new Bills Stadium, a hundred eight hundred and eight hundred million dollars for this. Do you know how, with a snap of their fingers, the government, if they wanted to, could end any sort of poverty poverty ridden area within whatever part of the country I they could tell end you, a real, that overnight a real quick story my wife and I spent a, a they week. just did it recently with when the Chinese president came to California they cleared out all the homeless and right. they they, they, they made it all look clean and and for, for the Chinese president and Perception then as soon as he left reality. they brought they they brought them all back in it's the craziest thing I've ever seen a, a guy in Zurich Switzerland who had just returned from his first trip to Chicago and I said so how did you like Chicago and he said well I've traveled to New York many times and and said, so it's kind of, that's a formula for me. Said, Chicago is really different. I said, it's a beautiful city downtown, isn't it? He goes, yes, but it's a terrible ride from the airport to the center of the city. He said, I've never seen poverty like that, even in Africa. And I, and he said, why do you let that happen? Mm. Because in Switzerland, they would never let that happen. It's not even, it's not even part of, the, of a possibility in his brain. And that's when I realized, oh, poverty is a policy choice. We've decided that 20% of our population will, can live in highly deprived and not even like scenarios. Bad and I, our not country, even care. No, I, care. I think it's because our country was founded on pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality. And I right. really don't believe. Yeah, go back in, and read De, De Tocqueville. And that, well, but that, because but I that have was a disabled a, son, a I worry of, about that. Right. But that's a, is a success, you know, the 1% we talk about yeah. or the, you know, the top 20%. That's yeah. them. Which that's an interesting point, though, because don't, do you, it, it's it's sort of fascinating when you see, when you see like the intentions of why the country was created, and then you see over time it's sort of with it, whatever whatever, the, whatever ideology takes over, right. the, it becomes a fad, and it's like, and then the the culture, whatever media pushes that out, and then it will change like but within every decade. But here's where the media helped. Remember the show The West Wing? Yes. I felt like we had a better public consciousness about what government could of look we like. Did. That show, I wish we had something like that again, because I, I loved it so much and I felt really good about it. And I feel like, you know, people are influenced by what they see in the media. Maybe we can't, you know, you really can't um, force someone to love, but you can do good examples, good models. And there's always going to be that outlier Absolutely. that can't be changed. But I'll give you an example of a good parent and love. So my, my youngest was very, very sick. And I'm a Southerner. I do not like to drive in the snow. Mm. And this is before Instacart. This is, you know, probably um, 15 years ago. And he was so sick. And I was newly divorced. And there was a blizzard. And I didn't have medicine in the house. He couldn't take a pill. He was little. I had to get my hands white knuckle gripped around that steering wheel and drive in a blizzard to get my boy medicine. Mm. And I thought to myself, this is the most, he's too little to remember this. Facebook reminded me of it because I use social media to post about extreme things like you do this. Po and you post some beautiful things. Thank you. Yeah. This, I got reminded of it this morning. This was one I wrote, you know, like 15 years ago or however long I've been on Facebook that I said, this is what real love is. Cause I am one of the, my biggest fears is driving in a winter blizzard, mm -hmm. but my boy needed medicine. Yeah. And I probably drove, you know, like one mile an hour. It took me a long time to, but I got that dad blame medicine and I got home and took care of my boy. Heart of the mom. It is. That's, yeah. that's what real love is. Making your, my definition of love, you asked me, you know, earlier, mm -hmm. making yourself um, of service to others, not letting your own needs trump those of the people around right. you. That is what love is. But I wanted to ask you, what is your definition of love? Well, I think you really have to make yourself vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You really have to allow yourself to be so vulnerable and that when you when you see something that hurts your soul, mm. you have to stop and do something about it. Mm. So 
the last few days, I'm a litter picker for one thing. So yeah. I go, I walk around, I pick up litter. I oh. live in Aranda Quite. I pick up litter. Yeah. And people say, how can you even touch that? And I I'll say, you know what's the most dangerous thing you're going to touch all day is the door handle on a restroom, yeah. yeah. even in your own house. Yeah. Or if you have a sponge, the kitchen sponge, that's the dangerous I don't, thing. I don't have sponges for that reason, you, but you now I'm going to go home and spray on my door handles. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but so you make yourself vulnerable and you look around and you take it inside, you take it and you look at other people. And instead of getting angry with the person who didn't, who, who almost cut you off while they're yeah. driving, try to figure out what's going on in their life that might make them feel that way. Yeah. You know, I just, I had a really terrible 24 hour bug. Two weeks ago. Yeah, that's why we have you here today. And I know, I and I wrote this thing that really touched like 1,200 people. Aww. Because oh, I just wrote a thing and I said, you know how lucky I am that, you know, in the middle of, of what I considered suffering, I haven't vomited in like 45 years. I was a Seinfeld episode. Yeah. And all of a sudden I vomited about 20 times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but I had every c- creature comfort around me. I was able to watch the Buffalo Bills game and I watched CBS Sunday morning and I had sweet music coming out of my Alexa and... And I had all the medications I needed and I had my wife coming in and taking care of me. And then I remembered something that m- many years ago, we had six French exchange students. One of our exchange students took us to the north of France where there was a refugee camp built for 2,200 people. Mm. And Cecile said to us, she said, you know, what? there's 42,000 people living in here. And if you wow. look, first off, the smell was astonishing. And if you looked inside of it and you realized most of it was a mud pit on a, on a dr- completely dry day and almost all those were bodily fluids that were causing that. Mm. And there was just no way to hand. Just think about being stuck in that scenario. Yeah. How much do we love our, our, hu- our fellow yeah. humans? Everybody's is, love is a little bit different. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, that's, the, that's, the, that's one of the unique things about America is that. With those different cultures, they each have a different idea of love. I don't know if it's unique about America. I think we just no, say it culture. more. Yeah. But, you know, there's but ours is multicultural. But, That's what's unique but about one it. Most thing yeah, I've countries noticed aren't. through this exercise I've been going through, there's a big difference in how um, people express love. Like my mom and dad gave me two different yeah. answers. My uh, my mom said it was an emotional, a deep emotional feeling. Where my dad said it's about making someone else happy. I sent Evan a, a song that I really love that means a lot to me. You knew this was coming up. I'm not going to let him get away with this. So when, uh, years ago, I was a domestic violence survivor, and I decided to join the fire department to give back to the people that helped me a lot. I had a broken nose, a compressed C4, C5. Um, my shoulder was almost dislocated. I had deep, deep bruises on both of my legs. I just had a lot of stuff going on. And the fire department came and stopped the spurting on my nose. And I didn't see them that night. I didn't see who it was. And it bothered me. And then they came when the police came to get me and my kids to a safe house. The fire department came back, the chief, and drove our stuff to a safe house. And he made like four trips. Just like five in the morning on a holiday. It was July 4th. So I joined my fire department. And um, it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. I was, and a, I was a volunteer for 10 years. I was terrified I, of heights, you know. And so I, I climbed a five-story building uh, with, a, a you know, the saw and the axe and chainsaw they and all that. Your, spin you around yeah, in, the, in the hook and, and ladder. And it was storming. <laughs> and we go to a concert a few years later with all these firefighters. And we still do. I still hang out with them. And we go to concerts together. And Dirks Bentley was in town at Darien Lake. And um, Jamie, uh, my friend Jamie. Amy Giovannini, who uh, she and I are really close friends and neighbors, she poked me. She goes, this is a song that makes me think of you. And I never heard it. And it's called Riser. And I sat there. It was nighttime. Well, now I feel horrible. I know. <laughs> you got to send it to me. I will. So I'm sitting there and it's, outside we're in lawn seats and it's star, stars and moon out. Dirk Bentley is on the big screen and he's right there singing this song. And it's about domestic violence survivor and how he's strong and he's going to be a protector. And you get the sense that he, too, is a domestic violence survivor. And I started just weeping in the middle of this crowd and crowd that. of You're people. You're doing it to me right now. Oh, and so I sent it to him expecting him to go, oh, and he goes, this is crap. Like, I really hate this. Yeah. Well, because the production <laughs> quality was terrible. I'm sorry. And the guy looks like, I couldn't get this out of my head. He looked like <laughs> Prince Harry if he was a Neanderthal. No, he's really hot. So I don't no, know what he's he talking really about. No, he really was. He, and, and like, I didn't, and like, I'm, I'm a victim of domestic violence myself. You're a survivor of I'm a survivor. Of the, oh, look, that's the correct term. I'm a survivor. No, it isn't correct. I'm just saying, empowering you. You choose however you uh, want to describe yourself. That, see, that's the problem. I can never empower myself. I don't know what it is. I'll work on that. We I, can teach you that. Yeah. That's I would love we could teach you that. That'll it's be a new, new episode. episode. Yeah. 
That'll be a new episode. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I mean, like really, really, if you've ever gone through therapy, one of the things you learn in therapy is I can teach you that. Yeah. But when, the thing that I think that media does, and I know we have to wrap up, um, is that I think it's what Tom said at the beginning. Really, the way you bring love into any relationship is what you have inside of you to start with. And for for me, I always thought of love as I wanted to be of service. I wanted to just delight and choosing the perfect birthday gift and having, I used to have dinner parties and I would spend so much time trying, if any guy I've ever dated, I have spent an inordinate amount of time making sure that I learn what makes them happy and then trying to give that. But I also wanted that in return. I didn't give it to them to receive, no. but I wanted to be seen the way they, the way I see them. I thought it was a great compliment to be seen that way. Doesn't mean they have to buy me anything, but just no, you know, Jerry likes poetry. Maybe I could read her a poem tonight. Or maybe I could listen to her read me a point. Like, it doesn't have to be monetary. No. And I also have found that I have become so self-sufficient. I got my own thing going on, and I don't leave space and room uh, for love to come in. I'm trying to make myself more vulnerable. That's a great description. I'm, I'm trying to make myself more vulnerable. It's really difficult for me. I am a control freak. And I am a former press secretary in the U.S. Congress. I, I control the message. You know, perception is reality. You're the gatekeeper. Having to, yes. <laughs> and I'm really good about that. I, I share a lot on social media. I do believe that could be used for good. I oh, keep up with absolutely. tons of friends. But I'm also, I'm not putting everything on there because I keep something for me. I don't have to live every single thing that I do. No out there so i think you know as a as a media scholar i think you kind of hit the nail on the head what we bring to social media is what we already had inside of us yeah. i do think that is true do you, do you yeah agree and, that? and you know one of the things i realized i started teaching in the college at 22 years old one of the things i kept reflecting on was that most of my college professors were less than average as mm -hmm. presenters mm. they were not very interesting and they really didn't give a damn about me and I remember going home and telling my wife, I said, I don't think I'm going to be a great teacher. I said, but I think my students are going to love me because I'm going to love them. Oh. And if you ever talk to my students, I used to tell them the first day of yeah. class, I'd say the next three months are going to be a love affair because oh. you know, you're really important to me. But if you start screwing up, I'm going to call your mother <laughs> <laughs> because that's how much I love you. And I oh. really want you to do well. And that I, never, I never gave tests because tests cause anxiety. Yeah. What I gave were projects, things that would make you want to be creative and want to develop something and turn it into a portfolio piece. Yeah. Show me a test that anywhere that's ever become a portfolio piece. That's a useful piece. thing that you well, get. Of course. That's, yeah. that's so much of what was missing. But you know how much more work that made for me? Yeah. And you know how many of my colleagues came to me and said, you're making it difficult for me because you, you give the pro you, the pro they hand in a project and I would put on the project incomplete and hand it back to them and say, why don't you, you know, you had some great ideas in here. Why don't you polish this a little bit, work on this, work on this, and then I'll, I'll grade it. Because in the real world, nobody grades things on the first time through. Yeah. And they don't give any tests. I don't, I never took any tests in the real world. None. Yeah. Zero. Wow. But projects, I worked on projects all the time. Yeah. Group efforts, worked on group efforts all the time, even though I never liked group uh, group work in classes, yeah, because I always th it always put the biggest burden on the most responsible yeah. person. So. Yeah, well, in, in closing, because I know we're running out of time, tell me what it is that you love about your wife and why. Oh, geez, everything about her. I mean, she's just precious. I, I still can remember the first time I saw her. I looked at her and I was sixteen. She was fifteen. I looked at her and I said, "I think someday I'm going to be with her." Oh, and, no, oh, and I'm and she cry. no, and she's been like that. And we've been like that forever. And we've been through some rock and roll. I mean, I watched her go through chemotherapy yeah. for six months and, and breast cancer twice. And I watched her survive two strokes. Mm. And she's just a beautiful creature in every way. And I try to be that back to her. Yeah. I think we, can, we kind of compliment each other. Yeah, well, that's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for thank joining you for having us. Me. And I would love to have you back. Yeah. Okay. I feel like I'm, a, I'm in a confessional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With somebody who gives a crap. Yeah, right. Oh, well, um, thank you for joining Sparks of Love. Have a great week, everyone.